This program is made possible in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, Frederick Hammersley Foundation, and viewers like you. This time on Colores. Creators of the documentary All Max Evans, The First Thousand Years, share insight into making a film about one of New Mexico's most colorful and beloved authors. This man has so many different sides to him and so many different pieces, and yet he's able to take all of it and, and create writing which somehow includes it all and also transcends it all. It's kind of remarkable. It's all ahead on Colores. How does a filmmaker choose moments from a 90-plus year life to tell a story? So that was a starting point, really. We're here with the creators of Old Max Evans, the first 1,000 years. Laureen, what was it about Max Evans that made you want to make a film about him? Well, I've known him for years, and his storytelling and his writing abilities always captivated me. And his, his, his expertise is a novella, a long, short story, short novel. And I would read things like The One-Eyed Sky, and I would be changed for days. I couldn't stop thinking about it. They were so perfectly constructed. But he's a, a consummate writer, and it's his storytelling and writing, and of course his whole life, that made me really want to do it. I think for me, it's just the, 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 the amazing amount of lifetimes he's, he's lived in one lifetime. You know, from this teenage cowboy, you know, through being a painter, a, a miner, a, a, a brawler, a World War II soldier, you know, then finally finding his, his, his uh, calling in writing. I mean, it, and, and then working in Hollywood, you know, going from <laughs> into that crazy world. It's just an amazing life that he's led. And uh, there's something just very unique about that. And he's one of a kind. There's nobody else who has lived the kind of life he's lived and made of it, the kind of art that he's made. I mean, I just wanted to capture that as little as we can, you know, capture another being. But to me, he's one of the most amazing people I've ever known in my life. And I wanted everyone to know about that. You know, uh, I've been writing about this my whole cockeyed life, but this thing right here, it's hard to believe that this is what changed the West forever. He knows how to turn a phrase. He told me, he said, one day I was so broke I forgot how to count. Half farm, half grassland, and only half enough of either one. Nowadays we give prizes for everything except knife throwing. A voice as smooth and slick as new shoes on ice. There's just been all these wonderful things going on in his mind all these years. Mostly that what you see is a very, very astute observer, not only of the human world, but of the animal world and the physical world itself. Paul, did you know how you were going to start the film? Uh, no, no. You, you never know how you're going to start a documentary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gathering all this material and, uh, you know, basically, you know, Lorene came to me and said, you know, I've never made a film before and because I've done so many documentaries, um, she asked me to help and, and come aboard and, and we had become such good friends uh, that I decided I would, you know, she seduced me into doing this project with her because I was trying to retire. <laughs> <laughs> and then he but, met Max. And then I met Max and fell in love with Max. And so then it was just a question of, you know, just starting the process. And so we started really with the interviews because, you know, obviously Max is getting older. We wanted to make sure we got him on camera before anything happened to him health-wise. That was a big concern of Lorene's. So we started with Max, and then Max also had a list that he had given Lorene of other friends and associates that he wanted to be involved in the film. So that was the starting point, really, was to do the interviews and get those underway. What was the biggest challenge? Structure. It's always, it's always structure, especially with a story as big as this one. Mm -hmm. I just read everything I could of, of him. He often wrote about things that happened in his life. He used that as a basis for his work, but sometimes decades later. So we wanted to have his, his life unfold, but be able to uh, use excerpts that he wrote later, and, and, and that was 
tricky yeah. uh, in terms of the timeline sometimes. You start getting into the film and, you know, Max is a cowboy, a rancher, a painter, a World War II veteran. Then you realize he's only 26. <laughs> so how do you choose what parts of life, of his life to include? Well, I mean, that is a dilemma because that's why he, he refers to himself as having lived a thousand years. And indeed, when you look at all the 20 some odd books he's written and then the life he's lived, the episodes as a, as a uranium miner, the episodes as a as, a, as a, a cowboy, of course, and as a painter and as a writer, all these very interesting things. And you have to go kind of where the spark is, where the energy is. And so we had a lot of long discussions about what, what parts to include. But one thing, Max even now is telling me stories that in 25 years I've never heard and <laughs> should have been in the movie. I said, you should have told me that soon. I mean He's 94 years old. You can't make a film that's 94 years long. So how did you decide? Coming in, as I had the luxury of coming in after the interviews had been shot. So to some extent, it's decided by the interviews. And of course, Lorene, having known Max for 150 years, <laughs> um, you know, you kind of knew where to go, you know, what stories you wanted to focus on. But still, we had way more than we could ever fit into a, a, a program. Yeah. Um, so at that point, it was just a question of, of winnowing and, and seeing you know, what kind of came to life, not just with Max's interviews and the other materials that we had and you know, whatever links I could come up with, but also the other interviews. And so we could have, I like, always like in these kinds of films to have it feel like the, the, the interviewees are having a kind of a conversation amongst themselves. So we could cut from one to the other and then, and then around the horn a little bit. And so they could each have a, a comment. So those particular stories that are in there in a way kind of emerged out of the footage. Paul, how did you decide to tell the World War II part? Well, it, you know, an interesting story is, is uh, Max is very reluctant to talk about it, as many mm. World War II vets are. And when Lorene was conducting the interview that day, she didn't know if he would open up or not, because that was one thing she, he had never really talked to her about. In all my years, right. he would not talk about the war. And the day that interview was taking place, this massive planes were going over because it, what's the airfield out there? Uh, Kirtland Air Force uh -huh. was having a vintage air show. And we could hear in Max's living room the sound of World War II airplanes and... So then that spurred Lorene to start to ask questions about World War II. And all of a sudden he started to open up. It was really an absolute gift because usually you're, you gotta, you gotta stop filming and hear the airplanes, the motorcycle, whatever. Right. But that's what spurred him back into a very vivid recollection of his time. He landed on D-Day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Destruction incarnate. The war was a blur, like a barroom brawl. There were no great organized plans and brilliant military tactics. No inflamed thoughts of glory and winning of great battles. No patriotic images of heroics and the flags of one's country waving in victory. There was simply a moving blur of frazzled images in a 20-yard circle. The war, the world, everything was all in this very small 20-yard circle. That's all he knew, all he felt, all he realized of existence and non-existence. All. All the patriotism, all that political agendas and one thing that go, go way out, out into the breeze when you're in the deadly combat and uh, people dying on both sides and in front and the back and everywhere else. It was so important to really be able to land that story. Um, because when he comes back from the war, that's when everybody kind of all his, him and his buddies kind of go wild for a while as he talks about. And, and his writing really ends up being mostly about the post-war American West mm -hmm. and, and the pickup truck coming in and how the, how the society changed then. And so having that war passage uh, scene to, to come off of, I think was extremely important. In doing this film, what did you learn about Max Evans? 
his writing is not just, he's not just a Western writer, he's a humanitarian, a, a writer of great literature that will last and last and last. Uh, he's also got a great sense of humor, so he made it a lot of fun. Um, what did, because I knew him better, so I didn't learn as much. What did you learn? Well, one of the most striking things to me about Max is, is that here he is a 12, 13 year old cowboy working on Gloria de Mesa, and he starts reading Balzac. <laughs> it was just Very like, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was one of the most surprising things to me. You know, it's sort of, you know, you don't expect a Western kid brought up in that life to be attracted to, you know, a, a French writer that way. But Max just adored his writing, and I think it was a main influence on him. And you think about Balzac's work, and it's, it, Max is, is very similar in terms of his humanism. You know, I think the way that Balzac can look at the good and bad in, in all people and, and the, you know, the grays of all these situations in human life, and I think that was highly influential on Max in terms of, of looking at the humanity of the people that he lived with in New Mexico. Um, and so, you know, it, that was incredibly striking to me. First thing when I read The Rounders uh, was I was reminded a bit of Mark Twain because of his uh, ability to write in colloquial mm. language and to capture the, the, the way people talk to each other. Um, and then when you take that and you add in mysticism, which was the big surprise for me, to understand right. how uh, he references everything to the great mystery in the sky, it, it, it's like this man has so many different sides to him and so many yeah. different pieces and yet he's able to take all of it and and create writing which somehow includes it all and tr also transcends it all it's kind of remarkable mm -hmm. how do you visualize that kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> well that was a big problem because for a long time in the cut they were just black holes mm -hmm. you know we kept thinking about photographs or stock footage and we couldn't find anything that seemed to be appropriate um, we didn't really have the budget or money to do recreations and it would be so cumbersome and, and, and costly to do recreations. And then it, I was talking to Lorene and, and we talked about how popular graphic novels are these days and thought maybe if we did it in a graphic novel style we could find an artist who could illustrate basically those sequences. And so uh, Lorene found out about this show of graphic novelists in Santa Fe at the City of Mud Gallery, and we went there together, and we were struck by this one artist, Jamie Chase in particular, who did The Hound of the Baskervilles. Mm. And those drawings just really hit us, like these would be perfect for Max's work. Well, and also Jamie, uh, before, like was a long-standing uh, portrait artist of, mm. of, you know, great talent. Yes. Um, so even before he got into doing graphic novels, it was clear that he could really paint and, and do an incredible job visualizing mm -hmm. um, faces, which was very important as well, because we wanted to, you know, Max appears himself in a couple of these uh, illustrations, uh, you know, uh, treatments as a, as a young man and, and older and so on. So we really wanted to be able to, him to do that, and boy. I yelled at Uncle Bob to reach in and take out the box of shotgun shells before they went off. He was standing, holding onto the steel post where the windshield had once been, yelling, they're going to get him, they're going to get him, hurry, hurry. I was hurrying as fast as I could, but at the same time, I didn't want those shotgun shells exploding. I needn't have worried, though, because just then we hit a gully about three feet wide and three feet deep, and the vehicle did a flip, and the trip was over. Since there was no top to hold us in, all three of us were propelled toward the sky like a trio of big ass birds. What stands out for you in the film? I think we're able to communicate his deep mysticism and the, the deep spiritual foundation that he has. In not any churchy, preachy kind of way, it just is manifest in his observation of nature. He's able to see the supernatural in the natural and make us feel it too. But that I, was a real revelation for me yeah. watching the film. I think people think he's, oh, he's a cowboy writer. No, no, he's a no. a western writer. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of my favorite little things actually has to do with his skills as a healer. Um, H-E-E-L-E-R. Right. Um, which has to do with calf rope. Mm, okay. Which was one of his great, great skills as a teenager. Um, and ranchers highly prized him because he was a good healer. 
And in cutting the film, we were struggling because I could not find good photographs of the healing process, and not, especially not with teenagers, with kids, young boys. And, you know, I always thought it was an important part of Max's life. And, and finally, again, in the cutting room, I was talking to these two, and I said, you know, I know we talked about not doing recreations and, and the cost of it and all that. I said, but this, this sequence is just not working, and it's so important. What if I try to go and find a young contemporary kid who can do this? And they were both a little reluctant and skeptical and, you know. It worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but I went online. I thought, well, I'm going to go to the New Mexico Rodeo Association. And then that directed me to the New Mexico High School Rodeo Association. That directed me to the New Mexico Junior High School Rodeo Association. And I had an email for them. I emailed them. Two days later, this man named John English called me and said, my son can do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he attached some videos to the email that showed his kid, uh, Sterling English, healing, you know, roping the calves in, in rodeo situations. And this kid was amazing. And so I, I sent it to them and showed them. And it was like, we found our guy. And he lived in Berlin, you know. Ah just, you know, not far from us at all, so. And he, they knew Max's writing. Well, that, that was yes, the other thing. Yes, his dad had, had been read, <laughs> had um, the rounders read to him every night when he was a kid. Really? He read it on to Sterling and his brother, <laughs> yeah, I know. Great mystery in the sky. Yeah, yeah. The connection, I know, it was unbelievable. When Max was 11, he began his cowboy career up on Glorieta Mesa, southeast of Santa Fe. He went up there to visit his uncle, Slim Evans, an amazing horseman. Working for rancher Pete Coleman and later Ed Young, Max survived many an ordeal over the next few years. Great fodder for his short stories. The ranchers grew to appreciate his determination and a certain very useful skill. I just naturally could use the ropes. And if you're branding and you heal a calf and drag it to the fire, you don't lose it near as much weight, you don't injure it. So uh, the old ranchers really started liking me because I could heal. Most fellers make the mistake of throwing too fast a loop to be good healers. You've got to kind of let it float down. Then just as the hind legs move against the loop, you pull the slack and you've got him. The big calf began bucking and bellering, but I turned old Snip and dragged it to the fire. Eldon ran up and got a hold of his tail and over he went. Pretty soon you could smell the hair burn from where they put the brand to him. Ed castrated, earmarked, and vaccinated him while Eldon held him. I let them have the slack, and the finished product got up shaking his head, wondering what in the world had happened to him. It was wonderful to hear the story about how High Low finally got made. Yeah. The High Low country was, was finally uh, picked up by Martin Scorsese and directed by Stephen Freer. Scorsese produced it and was shot here in New Mexico in 96 with Woody Harrelson and Sam Elliott has a part in it. Uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez, I think that was her. Patricia Arquette. Patricia Arquette. Penelope Jennifer, Cruz is Penelope first Cruz, American her, 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 film role. Yeah. It's not just a Western. What is it about High Low that's it's the post-war West, so it's a very different view of the West. It's not the 1890s. It's not the manifest destiny, you know, shoot 'em up. It's very much a contemporary story, and it, you see at the very beginning, you see uh, the, the Billy Crudup, right? If I got that mm -hmm. right, he, he's coming back from the war and the bus and coming back home, and so it's all evolving in the shadow of World War II, and. Um, Beyond that, it becomes an amazing story of uh, the death of Big Boy and, and how that happened. Uh, I won't give it away. Um, but uh, also, the, it's, for me, it's always the, the, the circumstances, the dialogue, and the humor, the unexpected humor that comes into it to, to kind of break the, uh, the, you know, the, the tragedy that happens. It's inspired by 
Max's life. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Max is the character that Billy Credit plays in the movie, but I'm going to give it away because it's such a Greek tragedy. This is way beyond post, you know, it is in this exquisite setting. But the fact is that his best friend was shot five times by his brother and killed a, as a young man. It's our earliest work that really expresses who we are. We're not really stretching as writers yet, so we're basing everything on uh, what we know best and how we grew up. So the hollow country tells that story, and uh, I think that's why it's got the heart of Max Evans in it. It was a strange feeling to go back to that country and watch him bury my best friend killed by his brother. <laughs> Survived invasions of four or five islands in the South Pacific in the Marine Corps, and there he was. That's what inspired that book, The High Low Country. I watched them lower big boy Matson into his grave. It was a large coffin, and yet I half expected it to burst apart from the weight and size of the man. Not only his physical bigness, but from the whole of his being. Not very long ago, I had been one of them but I had left and gone to another part of the land. The people were fast becoming strangers to me, as I to them. But the land, the great swelling earth under my feet, was mine. And I belonged to it, even as the man it now reclaimed. I looked down from the wind-stroked hill to the town, Hilo, New Mexico. It didn't seem to be affected by the death of its strongest son. The event had been anticipated for so long, it had lost its impact. One thing too about Max is we haven't quite mentioned is, is that he's, people love him and he's quite a gentleman. And you know, when, when we thought about approaching Sam Elliott to do the reading, we didn't know whether Sam would agree or not. I mean, he's a, he's a huge Hollywood star. And, uh, but you know, when we cont I contacted his agent, um, and, and finally she got back to me and she said, uh, Sam would be honored to read the voice for uh, this film about Max Evans because she said he would do anything for Max. And that's how we finally got you know, because of that relationship that had developed when they were doing the high-low country um, and Sam's memories of, of, of Max as a man and as a gentleman that, that he, he decided to agree to do it for us. And that's how it is with Max. Everyone who knows him loves him. I mean, he's so honest and straightforward and funny and charming <laughs> that anybody in his life, all these people that we interviewed about him, they were happy to do it. They had great stories. They could hardly wait. What is it about Max's writing and his work and his life that is so important? That What does it mean for New Mexico and for American literature? Well, you know, again, I, I come from the East, so I'm, I'm transplanted here. And um, I think what is so amazing about Max is that he is able to paint a picture of what life in New Mexico was like from that post-war period in America up to the present moment. I mean, he really captures the feeling of what the people of New Mexico are like, what cowboying is like, what ranching is like, uh, what the relationship between Hispanic and Anglo is like, uh, the relationship with the Pueblo Indians. I mean, there's so much that's covered in Max's work that's specific to New Mexico. But what Max does in terms of his story, stories in his writing is he, 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 does, he brings out the universality of it. There's a great specificity in terms of place, but there's also the wonderful universality of the emotions and the drama that happens to people in any part of the world that I think connects him, uh, you know, to the world's great writers, you know, and takes him out of being specifically just a Western writer who was just doing shoot 'em ups and that kind of thing. Uh, and that's always the misconception, I think, with Max. People just think he's like Zane Grey, but he, he goes beyond Zane Grey. Uh, there are just so many more qualities in his writing that makes him a much more important writer. And that's why I think people should, and we, we made the film hoping that it would get people back to reading his books because they are, I think, classics. Um, and he should be, you know, more appreciated in my mind 
as, a, as the great American writer that he is, and, and not just the great Western writer, or the great New Mexican writer. He goes beyond that. I mean, his work is a great gift to the entire country and to the world. And also, he doesn't write the same thing all the time. He, his uh, Madame Millie, which is a story of a madam in Silver City, is one of the best-selling books that UNM Press has ever had. It's a straight-out biography. He's done um, uh, animal stories <clears throat> that are completely the anti-Disney. I mean, he observes animals so well. He's particularly fond of coyotes. Coyotes are his brother, and he tells amazing coyote stories. But then also, um, he's got a whole book of animal stories. He's got a book called For the Love of a Horse. He got Blue Feather Fellini, which is his magnus opus. And it's in two parts, uh, the war and then in the spirit realm. It's just a world to fall into and you're guided by his amazing powers of observation and then his, his ability to express what he sees. Well, Max is wonderful. It's a really a wonderful film and uh, it makes me want to go out and dive in and read everything he's ever written. <laughs> Thank you all, the creators of Old Max Evans, the first 1,000 years. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. To view this and other Colores programs, go to NewMexicoPBS.org and look for Colores under local productions. Also, look for us on Facebook and Instagram. Until next week, thank you for watching. This program is made possible in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, Frederick Hammersley Foundation, and viewers like you.